Thank you very much. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here today. And um, at a very young age, I had found myself, you know, eight years old, seven years old, always observing my neighbor's dog, my neighbor's chicken, any animal I saw there, I was trying to get into their head. What was the chicken thinking about? What's the dog doing, you know? And then at the age of nine, my father asked me, he said, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was weaned on uh, nature documentaries. And I said to my dad, dad, I want to be like that guy on television. And his name was David Bellamy. And he was an uh, amazing guy. He was fascinating, old fascinating. At the age of nine, I knew what I wanted to do. Ten years later, at the age of 19, I became a banker. <laughs> Four and a half years into banking, um, I came to an important crossroad in my life, and I decided that's it. You know, I, I joined the bank for the wrong reason. It wasn't my cup of tea. I really joined the bank because I was, the bank had good rugby teams, and I used to enjoy a second row rugby. And uh, after several uh, serious knockabout, I decided, you know, when my rugby is over, I'm going to be a, a banker. And I didn't fancy that. So I left banking, bummed for three years, ended up in Langkawi 26 years ago. And today, that's the view out of my window. That's my shower. <laughs> that's the road leading uh, to my office at rush hour. <laughs> my neighbors, more my neighbors, some unfriendly ones for some people, but I love them nevertheless. My favorite bird, the great hornbills. They can teach you a lot of things, the great hornbills, and they can talk, talk, teach you about relationships. You know, these birds are monogamous, they're born for life. 30% of all birds, uh, sorry, 30% of all birds born for life. 45% are together until their young have left. And the remainder 25% are polygamous birds. <laughs> what kind of bird would you prefer to be? <laughs> A chicken pecking on the ground, polygamous, or an eagle soaring our skies. And I put that to many honeymooners. No honeymooner in the entire time that I've done my walks ever said they wanted to be a chicken. <laughs> I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so, try to revisit evolution and try to remove a misconception that has crept into evolution, and the theory of evolution. Now this is uh, through little stories, and this is one interesting story. I've chosen this bird, it's one of my favorite birds. It's called the Greater racket Tail Drongo. I know in, in the English language, if somebody calls you a drongo, it's not meant to be a compliment. <laughs> yeah, but that's another story. But this bird is a marvelous mimic of human uh, sorry, it's a marvelous mimic of many birds. It can mimic the call of many birds and even mimic the call of the macaque monkey. This bird, macaque monkeys and squirrels have formed a partnership. Wherever the monkeys are in the morning and in the absence of monkeys, wherever the squirrels are in the morning, these birds tag along, they follow. As monkeys jump from tree to tree, branch to branch, they trash the branches about heavily. This disturbs insects. Insects take flight, and the drongo catches those insects. What then, in any partnership, both parties should benefit. What is the monkey getting out of the relationship? What is the squirrel getting out of this relationship if the monkey is getting all the bugs? Now, a big enemy of baby monkeys, of squirrels and other rodents, including snakes and lizards, are birds of prey. And one of the baddest birds on the island 
is the mountain hawk eagle. The mountain hawk eagle not only takes snakes and lizards, it will take unattended baby monkeys. And whenever these birds uh, uh, from their heights decide it is time to get lower over the forest canopy, as they get over and over the forest canopy, it's usually the squirrels, which are so good with shapes, that they are the first ones to give off an alarm. And they give off, squirrels give off the alarm according to the level of danger the enemy affords it. There is in the rainforest among squirrel world, yellow alert, orange alert, red alert, and for the mountain hawk eagle, severe status. And the squirrel telegraphs the information. First squirrel sees it, gives it alarm. The next, next alarm is the eagle flies over this part, the next alarm and so forth. And the eagle comes to rest now. If there's any drongos in the neighborhood, they charge along racing to where the last alarm was given. And they come and surround the eagle. I can show you only one. As you can see the drongo is over there. There it is. And that's the eagle. The drongo is surrounded. They, they make a hell of a racket telling the whole neighborhood, here's where the eagle is, here's where our enemy is. Yeah, you see him. They occasionally try to feign an attack. They tell everybody exactly where the eagle is. For the eagle, the element of surprise is over. Everybody in the valley knows exactly where it is. And as soon as the eagle takes off, the drongo charges in, attacking it, mobbing it, harassing it, even taking the feathers of the head of the eagle. I've counted that two dozen times, I stopped counting, how many times the drongo have come right up and take the feathers of the head of the, uh, of the, the eagle. And so the eagle has to then uh, pick on those poor fellows that have no hearing or poor eyesight. So in the end, the snakes get it. <laughs> the, the lizards get it, poor fellows, my friends. Now, I want to talk about in nature, there is many type of symbiotic relationships. Symbiotism is an umbrella term for relationships between uh, organisms. It could be a one-to-one -one relationship or it could be one among several. And I just showed you one sort of relationship. Uh, this is a staghorn fern. It's an epiphyte. The seeds are carried by wind. It establishes itself on a tree. It takes this shape. This shape allows it to collect rainwater, moisture. It is then broken down and falling leaves from the host tree, which is then broken down and reused by the plant. They do not harm their host. They do not benefit their host. They're using space, but not paying rent. And that relationship in, in science is called uh, commensalism. There's another sort of partnership in nature, and uh, uh, by the way, commensalism began about uh, 600 million years ago in our oceans. It's a very successful um, re uh, formula, and it's everywhere. Another interesting uh, relationship out there, uh, and I chose this example, it's on my walk, uh, that's a cycad. And cycads are very ancient plants that have been on the planet certainly for a very, very long time. And cycads come in a male form and a female form. And this is typical of most of the early plants. And the, the way of pollination is conducted by a little uh, bee. Called, uh, it's, in Malay, it's called kalulut. It's a stingless bee, and that stingless bee is the agent of pollination. So now you're coming to another relationship. Here's a partnership between an insect and a plant. In fact, the, the relationship between the, the bee and the cycad is often described as the earliest living example of insect-plant partnership. And it goes on to the roots, and the cycads cannot, um, cannot uh, fix nitrogen. So in their roots, they've invited an ancient bacteria called cyanobacteria. 
to come and occupy their roots and in return for providing cyanobacteria, formerly called blue-green algae, a little space to live. Cyanobacteria then, through photosynthesis, fixes atmospheric nitrogen and share it with the host. So this is referred to as mutualism, using space, paying rent. Okay. Now, and it's everywhere. It began 550 million years ago in our oceans. It's still around. It's a very successful uh, formula. Then I want to talk about this interesting plant. Up there is a mistletoe. It's our mistletoe. The mistletoe has a parasitic relationship with its host. The seed is carried by a little bird. The seed is deposited at the top uh, of the, on, a, on a twig and the seed uh, then germinates and insert its roots into the delivery system of the host plant and it robs the host plant of nutrients. This tree is Lagos, it's a species of Lagostroma that was introduced to the island of Langkawi. It has, it has today 16 mistletoes on it. It's introduced, it's not native to the island. This tree is in trouble. It's 20 years old right now, planted on the island about 18 years ago, as a two-year-old. And right next to it is another similar uh, Lagostroma. This one here. It was infected by the mistletoe a lot earlier and it's severely stunted. Yeah, the, the first tree is about this big. This one's about that big. Infected earlier, half the tree is already dead. And right next to it is another similar tree, which I saw through the many years walking this walk. It's dead in the undergrowth. Also a Lagostroma, similar species. So the mistletoe finally has done its bidding. It has killed its host. Now, I want to show you another Lagostroma, native to the island of Langkawi. And here it is. It's Lagostroma langkawiensis. It's our very own Lagostroma. Nowhere else on the planet but Langkawi Island. And not, not a single mistletoe on it. Its secret is in the bark. Whereas earlier, this is the bark of the introduced species. It's like any other tree with lichen and so forth on it. But here's the bark of our Lagostroma. It's a bark that sheds twice a year, making it difficult for any sort of mistletoe or epiphyte or any kind of plant to lodge itself. By peeling off, it drops it off and thus able to live in its environment without, uh, by controlling this or managing this problem, the mistletoe problem. Now, this is a fine example of what Sir Charles Darwin tried to put forward in the theory of evolution. Have you heard of the term survival of the fittest? Many people, and 80% of my guests on my walks, uh, will say, well, I haven't asked them, can you please translate that? And many people translate that simply to mean survival of the stronger. But the term survival of the fittest was not a term introduced by Sir Charles Darwin, but rather by this man, Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer was a social philosopher and economist. I'm sure some of you are going to learn about him in this inset, right? He's a social philosopher, economist. And what survival of the fittest then totally has a different meaning today. Just like when I was a kid, the word gay had a totally different meaning <laughs> than today, right? But Darwin, in fact, said this. It's not necessarily that the stronger or more intelligent that's successful, but rather those that have adapted, and I'll add on, 
adapted to live in its environment together better. He's not denying that for the, for the lion, strength is important for the lion as it brings down the buffalo, and likewise for the buffalo as it brings down the, uh, as it fights off the lion, lioness. Notice I said lioness. Lions under the tree hanging out. <laughs> now, uh, it's, the speed is important for the cheetah as it brings down the gazelle and agility important for the gazelle as it tries to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, escape the, the claws of the cheetah. But what he's saying is there are many, many other formulas for success. And that's what I tried to show in the very beginning. Commensalism is a successful formula. It's still around, it's everywhere. Mutualism, very successful formula, it's everywhere. Between you and rice, you love rice? Lies are up to you because if it wasn't because you love rice, rice wouldn't be so successful. As simple as that. Yeah? Um, uh, and also, uh, there is, oops, let me get back. There is also, it usually takes more than one lioness to bring down that buffalo. She also needs the cooperation of other lionesses to do the job. There are many formulas for success. Not only intraspecies, group of pride of lionesses, but also interspecies. And I go back to my favorite bird, the greater racket-tailed drongo, the monkey, and the squirrel. My hero in all of this is none other than the great Alfred Russell Wallace. Alfred Russell Wallace in 1885. Now you must understand where the corruption of Stronger came into evolution when evolution was presented to the world. Um, it was the second industrial revolution. In the second industrial revolution, two powerful groups of people emerged, industrial capitalists and das Kapital, Karl Marx, socialism. These both powerful uh, ideologists competing for raw materials and markets, which are in South America, Africa, and Asia. And so by promoting the view that nature supported stronger, it allowed, it legitimized conquests, colonization, etc., for the raw materials that was in this part of the world. Wallace is my hero. He said this in 1885 in an article called Bad Times. He is the co-founder of the theory of evolution. Co-founder. You've not heard of him. Not many people have. He said this, this corruption of our science, evolution, for material gain will lead us at that time, Europe, to a catastrophe. He will die in 1913. In 1914, the first catastrophe. Fighting in the trenches of the First World War was none other than the monster Adolf Hitler. And he will take us to the second catastrophe. Throughout history, I end with this, powerful interests, whether it's in the jungles of Borneo or in smoke-filled rooms of gentlemen clubs in London or anywhere else, to be Kuala Lumpur too. Um, powerful interests, powerful interests have manipulated information, knowledge, science, economics, and even religion as a means to gain advantage. We choose the future we choose. They're the only creature in this whole planet of ours in, has, in our, has the ability to choose conscious, consciously uh, our future. We make a choice. All the trouble you're seeing on the planet today, in, in Syria, in North Africa, in the banking industry, in, in Greece, etc., it's not, it's not about putting food in your stomach. It's about fighting for justice. And rats in a laboratory condition don't fight for justice. They fight for food. We are more than animals. We fight for social justice. We fight for economic justice and even environmental justice. The future is in your hands. Thank you.